hello everybody and welcome to our webinar today uh, titled live and fixed cell single cell analysis with simultaneous submicron infrared and Raman. today i'll be joined by professor peter gardner he's from the university of manchester a professor in analytical and biomedical spectroscopy he'll be giving the main portion of our talk uh, as a primer i'll be giving my introductory section i'm my name is mustafa kansas I'm the Director of Product Management and Marketing at Photothermal Spectroscopy Corp. Uh, anyone interested in Peter Gardner's uh, extensive and pretty impressive uh, bio can read that on our website um, and in the email uh, that was with the invite that came out. Uh, I do want to jump straight into it because I know we are stressed for time, or pushed for time rather. Uh, any questions that come up, please uh, do write them into the uh, chat field, or the question field. Uh, that you see on the screen there. Uh, we'll endeavour to uh, read them out and answer them at the end of the webinar. Anything that we fail to or run out of time for, we'll get back to you via email as soon as possible afterwards. Okay, I'm going to jump straight into it. Today's outline, so I'll start off by giving you a brief rundown on the current, or as I see them, the current infrared and Raman microscopy limitations. Um, I'll then introduce to you um, about all about optical photothermal infrared spectroscopy and, and how, it, how it overcomes a lot of those limitations. And then I'll give you a whirlwind tour on a whole host of applications. I'll prim primarily focus on life science, but I'll, I'll throw in a few other uh, applications of, um, of OPTR and simultaneous Raman before I hand over to Professor Peter Gardner for the main part of the talk. Okay, so I assume a lot of you are going to be familiar with infrared spectroscopy and microscopy. Uh, it's been around for a while, it's a fairly mature technique, um, and as such, it's kind of reached its limits as to what it can do. Uh, and perhaps it's its most fundamental limit, and this is a uh, an optical sort of physical limit, is spatial resolution. And since we're dealing with infrared wavelengths, our spatial resolution isn't going to be or cannot be as good as it is uh, in, in the visible. You can see that very clearly uh, on the screen there. In the left, we have a, a target that's quite crisp and sharp, uh, especially some of these the smaller ones here. In the visible, but you move to the infrared, things start to blur out. And there's not much that can be done about that. So you know, most infrared microscopes out there uh, are going to be getting resolutions in the order of maybe 10 to 20 microns. Some of the better ones might be uh, on, on the lower end of that. Uh, there's also the issue of complex summer preparation. You know, for anything infrared, the best quality spectra are typically those obtained in transmission mode through thin sections through thin cuts. Some are dependent, it's going to be in the order of 5 to 20 microns, and you know, there are some things you just cannot cut or are very difficult to cut. Um, the accessory um, or mode of ATR is, is fairly common, and that goes some way to addressing some of these issues, but it requires in intimate contact. Uh, pr precise targeting is difficult. So if, if you have particles there touching them with the crystal, it can make the particles move. Uh, there's risk of cross-contamination with something remaining on the tip as you move from one point to the next. Of course, there's the risk of crystal damage. Um, they, they can be easily scratched and they're expensive to replace. And there's, of course, the risk of sample damage or sample indentation. And here's a, a nice example of that, of what can happen when you do multiple contacts along, a, uh, along the sample. You can see the ATR tip has left indentations and marks as it's, as it's scanned across. Right. So you generally want to avoid that where possible. Uh, but perhaps one of the biggest, uh, perhaps lesser known or understood issues are what we call these dispersive scatter artifacts. Right. So if we start off with this ideal situation of a thin film measurement in transmission, right? imagine that's a thin film there, the light goes uh, in through, uh, through the film, you end up with a nice spectrum, nice flat baseline, nice symmetric peaks. <clears throat> this is a spectrum of uh, polymethacrylates. If you take the exact same material uh, presented as a sphere and measure that in transmission mode, uh, well, the spectra all of a sudden look really different. Uh, you have uh, offset baseline, you have uh, features in the baseline, you, your peaks are split and shifted. Uh, worse still, uh, this effect is rather size dependent. So as we change the shape and size, uh, things change drastically. Right. So it, it just makes for any interpretation or identification of your materials really difficult because your spectra now are not chemistry or rather not only chemistry dependent, but also sample shape and size and, and surface roughness dependent as well. 
Uh, if we move over to Raman microscopy, well, that's got a whole host of other limitations. Now, Raman, of course, is, is not as mature. It's still, there's still a fair bit of technological achievements happening there, but that's also uh, plateauing off. But I'm sure anyone to, who's used a Raman microscope would, would, if you ask them what the number one issue is, it's going to be autofluorescence, right? Uh, and many samples, especially biologicals, have significant autofluorescence, often swamping the signal or requiring more complex uh, methods to get around them. Uh, one of which is to move to longer excitation wavelengths, for example, out to 785 or into the 800s of nanometers. But of course, that comes with a massive sacrifice in, in sensitivity because of this one on land to the power of four relationship. Uh, as, as the excitation wavelength gets longer, uh, the sensitivity drops off really, really quickly. Uh, so, so speaking of sensitivity, not only that, Raman just to begin with has a really low, what's called a, a Raman cross-section. Uh, so it's just a fundamentally limited uh, sensitivity technique relative to, to infrared. Uh, you also must collect in full hyperspectrum if you want to do imaging. So you can't do single frequency imaging. In fact, this is an issue that's also applicable to your traditional FTIR instruments. Uh, for those doing live biological work, uh, which is obviously the main topic of today's talk, phototoxicity uh, can be a major issue. Uh, in order to get good sensitivity, uh, the, more laser, the more laser power you put in there, the better the sensitivity. But of course, when you start getting too much in there, the, the live organisms don't like that. And, and often when you, have to, when you put in tens of milliwatts, uh, that's that's not great. The, the 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 organisms aren't happy under those conditions. So you have to operate at much lower power levels, which um, drops the sensitivity and, and extends the measurement time. Um, now, if you drop the sensitivity, or if your sample burns, or if it's phototoxic, if you drop the sensitivity, or the laser power rather, as I said, the Raman signal always drops significantly, which isn't the case in OPTL, as I'll explain later. Um, and then there's also the other issue of this uh, wave this, this spectral dependence on excitation wavelength so the spectrum of one material at different wavelengths excitation wavelengths uh, may change especially if there are visible or resonances um, in, in that visible spectral range uh, but even beyond the sample the substrates themselves uh, have a dependency on excitation wavelength for example glass um, and, I, and i've just experienced it recently myself Turns out to be a fairly poor choice at, four, at 785, but it's generally okay at 532. So there are these extra considerations and complications. Well, with that, I do want to introduce to you uh, our technique, uh, optical photothermal infrared or OPTIR. Uh, it's essentially a pump probe optical spectroscopy technique, where the pump in this case is a infrared, a tunable pulsed infrared laser to excite the sample and the probe that we use to detect this effect is typically a short wavelength visible laser or, or a near infrared laser as well. With this technique, we deliver sub micron infrared spectroscopy. In fact, I'll, I'll, so I'll say this a lot it's, it's very much like Raman in, in many aspects, uh, except that we're delivering infrared um, spectrum information, the richness of the infrared, as I call it. The spectra that we obtain look like they've been collected with an FTIR in, in transmission mode, but it's been, but we den, generally operate in reflection mode. Um, and, you, and anyone who's worked with FTIR in reflection mode will know that it's, it's not a common mode and it usually comes associated with a lot of distortions um, and spectrum artifacts, none of which in this um, mode of operation uh, appear. So we work in reflection mode, but deliver transmission-like spectra uh, free of distortions, artifacts, or interference fringes. Uh, it's a non-contact technique uh, that minimizes some operation. And the spatial resolution is wavelength, infrared wavelength independent. How might this uh, technique work? I've got a little video to take you through it. Uh, so it all starts with the uh, microscope objective. It's a reflective Cassegrain style. Uh, through that, we shine a pulsed infrared laser beam and being infrared, it's fairly broad, maybe around 10 microns. At the same time, we're shining in our probe beam, the green, that's about 500 nanometers. The infrared generates thermal expansion as it's, as it's expanding, and that thermal expansion changes the way the green light is reflected or scattered back. Right, so as we're tuning our infrared laser, 
from one wavelength to the other, we monitor the intensity of the green light reflected back. And it's from that that we calculate out a pure, what is essentially a pure infrared spectrum collected in reflection mode. In this slide, I attempt to compare uh, traditional infrared spectroscopy or microscopy, FTIR, with Raman microscopy uh, versus several what I believe are key attributes or, or performance metrics for these systems. For example, spatial resolution. If you're using a microscope, you typically care about spatial resolution. So, and for that, well, if you really wanted the best spatial resolution, you'd be going to Raman microscopy and not to a traditional FTIR microscope. So given that a red and the other a green. If you were worried about fluorescence, well, you'd be steering clear of Raman, given that a red, and infrared's gonna be fine from that perspective. Spectral sensitivity, as I mentioned before, is not so great typically with Raman, and IR is generally fairly good with that. Thus, speed of measurement also is pretty good. Uh, when it comes to ex the extensiveness of libraries, um, if you're doing, if you're using commercial libraries, or just if you're wanting that spectral interpretability or, or the richness, as I call it, uh, infrared is much better for that. You know, when it comes to the commercial libraries aspect, uh, there are about ten times as more commercial infrared libraries than there are Raman libraries. Uh, if you want to work in reflection mode, which is a generally easier and more preferred mode, uh, you know, it's non-contact standoff and so on, well, IR isn't great for that typically. In Raman, that's, that's the main mode of operation, so that gets a nice green. Water vapor is, is, can be a big issue in IR. It's not an issue in Raman. Water solvent compatibility, if you're doing live cells, again, another topic of today's webinar, uh, is, is typically an issue of traditional IR, uh, not so much with Raman. Glass substrates, likewise, and spatial independence of resolution independence uh, as well. Now, if you look at that, it's no, if you look at this table here, this colorful table, you can see it's no surprise that most labs have two instruments. They'll have an infrared, they'll have a Raman, and depending on the needs of the experiment, you may go to one or the other, or you know, worse, you may have to go to both instruments and take your sample across and try and find that same uh, same spot. Well, what we do with OPTR is, and it's my favorite animation, is we take the best of those instruments and combine them into one. Um, and that is almost literally what we do. We combine the best of traditional IR and Raman into a single platform. Um, here I want to take you through some uh, new developments in, especially with respect to pump sources, so the, our, our infrared sources. Um, our standard UCL, uh, covers 1800 to 950, consists of a three chip device. Uh, we also have the option for a second laser, an OPO laser, if you're interested in some of these high wave number OHA, CH, NH type bands that covers 36 to 2700. Uh, but with the QCL comes actually some really interesting options out here, uh, somewhere in the middle, these, these more custom options. Uh, my favorite at the moment is the CH region chip, and that gives you 3000 and 2700, and that can be coupled with these three chips to make a single device, uh, what we're calling dual range CH fingerprint QCL, which uh, covers all of the really interesting parts of the infrared spectrum. Uh, there's also options for silent region chips, especially if you're doing anything with uh, carbon deuterium, triple bonds, nitriles, alkyl, al al alkanes, excuse my language, and that is, is a separate device yet again. Um, and if you're interested in any lower wave number features, say down to about 800, we also offer a wide range Q so that goes down to 800 wave numbers. Uh, on the probe or Raman excitation laser front, of course, the, those two are the same. The probe for the OPTR also doubles as the Raman excitation laser. Our standard is a 532, and we have the optional 785 for samples that are dark or easily burned, or uh, for those that may have uh, fluorescence issues in, on the Raman channel. Uh, just to give you some examples with the dual range uh, CH fingerprint QCL. Uh, so what I'm about to show you here uh, is all reflection mode data, giving you transmission-like spectra. Uh, they've all been collected in under five seconds from about a 500 nanometer spot. Um, so yeah, so transmission, we're comparing to FTIR versus this reflection mode uh, with OPTIR of thick block. So it's thick blocks versus thin that we compare in here. Right, so that's the first comparison, it's polypropylene. 
In red, we've got the FTIR reference. In black, we've got the OPTIR spectra. You can see it's a pretty, pretty good fit, pretty good match. Same with polyethylene, uh, PET, nylon, and polystyrene. So yeah, at first glance, they're almost perfectly overlapped. Uh, spatial resolution is something that we talk a lot about. Spatial resolution is obviously pretty important. You're always wanting to push, or typically you're wanting to push uh, the limits and the boundaries when it comes to um, spatial resolution. Uh, and it's important to understand that with the regular FTIR, because the pump and the probe are the same, uh, you're wavelength dependent. Right? Uh, the spatial resolution is, is described very simplistically with the Rayleigh criterion. Uh, it has a uh, dependency on uh, the lambda on, on the wavelength and an inverse dependency on the numerical aperture. So you can see at the longer wavelengths, so at these lower wave numbers, the longer wavelengths, the spatial resolution numbers are much higher, which means they're worse because you want lower numerical values for spatial resolution. But with, with the Mirage, uh, we have not only do we have a high NA, it's the probe wavelength, which is which is at, at 532 nanometers. Uh, and when you plug that into that equation, we get about 416 nanometers theoretical spatial resolution. And the best part of all, it's it's flat across the entire spectral region. So whether you're at the short end or the long end in terms of wavelengths, it's the same. The spatial resolution is the same. And if you convert that to FTI at say a thousand wave numbers, you're looking at around a 30x improvement. Okay. Um, but perhaps the biggest excitement, uh, exciting element to everything we do here is the fact that finally we can do infrared and Raman together simultaneously, right? same spot, same resolution, same time. Uh, and in a nutshell, what we're doing here is we're throwing in the infrared light from our typically our QCL, these are pumped tunable, pulse rather tunable um, infrared sources. We put that through our uh, microscope objective, a, uh, typically a Cassegrain objective, reflective. Um, at the same time, we're bringing our probe beam, typically our green 532. We focus that into a sample. That's where that photothermal magic happens that I, that I described before. The reflected beam that's now modulated, that, can, that contains that infrared information in the green, goes on to our, our visible detector. And that's another important point that I think I failed to mention is that the infrared starts and stops with the QCL. Everything after the QCL happens in the visible. So there are no infrared detectors. Therefore, there is, there's no liquid nitrogen cooling. That's another important point to note. Um, but yeah, so the infrared is extracted out of uh, the visible um, beam details. Uh, but remember, since we're using a Raman grade laser here for our probe, the Raman effect is happening. Whether we like it or not, whether we want to collect those photons or not, it's there. So when it's there, we're actually taking advantage of that. And we, we throw in here a diquoic that separates out only the Raman shifted photons into the Raman spectrometer. The unshifted photons or the Rayleigh scattered light is, is what goes on to the visible detector for infrared um, signal extraction. Okay. So doing it this way takes full complement, takes advantage of the full complementarity of IR and Raman. It's also confirmatory, right? So your infrared results can confirm the Raman and Raman can confirm the IR. It's a single instrument, single platform, gives you far more thorough sample characterization, I've already mentioned, uh, the relatively new 785 options. Okay, so in this section, uh, I want to give you a whirlwind tour of of applications, but it's important to note that, you know, for almost anything that you can do with infrared or FTIR, or anything you can do with Raman, those sort of applications are also equally applicable and powerful uh, on this platform. All right. Um, also, want to point out very proudly, like a proud father here, that uh, publications are on the rise, and it's just quite meteoric. We've, we started from fairly humble beginnings, uh, and last year we were up at around maybe 14, 15 publications at the end of 2020, um, and this year we're well past uh, 20, and I expect. Uh, to be between 30 and 40 by the end of the year. So it's, it's very much, it's, it's, it, it's a positive exponential curve that I really like to see these days. Uh, but I do encourage anyone to look into or are interested to, to visit our publications website, please. Um, I'll start off with a plastic, a bioplastics um, application here. This is uh, with Curtis Marcotte and I saw a noter who's the inventor of Nodex. You may maybe have heard of the plastic. So we used uh, infrared and Raman simultaneously to measure a cross-section, a PHA, that's a biodegradable polymer, and 
the PLA is, is as well. Uh, and they were interested in this interface layer, um, suspecting or suspected of some mixing there. So we did these line profiles at 100 nanometer steps, uh, doing a single uh, line profile that gives us two data channels, OPTIR and Raman. I'm going to go very quickly through this, um, zooming into the infrared um, here for a second. Each one of these spectra uh, are separated by 100 nanometers. Right? So you can see that even with 100, 100 nanometer separation, we're actually seeing chemistry change across that really small interface in the infrared. Um, you can do single frequency images, pick out 725, 1760, uh, you get nice images. And if you if you look at the edge profiles here, some of these, you can see how sharp the edges are, indicating how good uh, the spatial resolution is. Uh, microplastics, hot topic at the moment. Um, and so we've done some model measurements there and some real world measurements, but this is one I particularly like because it's it's a real stress stress challenge. We've thrown in there polystyrene beads of various sizes from 900 microns up to about 10 microns. We've thrown in some PMMA beads. But just to make that even harder, we've, thrown, we've done that in salt water and then dried it. So now we end up with uh, particles, polymer, polymer beads interspersed with salt crystals. And if anyone's done any work with FTIR with salt, uh, you'll know that, any, that the presence in the vicinity of your measurement spot of any salt crystals will, will scatter the, the infrared light like crazy and your spectra end up um, looking like garbage, which is why you avoid uh, salt crystals like the plague. So what we have here, so here's the actual results. So um, in blue, we've got our PMMA beads. Remember, they're all, they're, they're of a single size. It's the polystyrene that have a, very, a range of sizes, but it's, it's great to see that the spectra are consistent regardless of particle shape or size. If you, I'll, I'll arch back to what I said in the beginning about these dispersive and scatter artifacts and how different, in traditional FTIR, uh, different, diff, different size particles will give you know, massively different spectra or as you can see here, that doesn't happen. The polystyrene spectrum looks the same, whether it's uh, a 900 nanometer sphere or, or a 10 micron bead. I also should point out here that here's, here's some salt crystals right next to a, um, a, a polymer bead. And in this case, because we know what we have here, we can actually pick two prominent peaks, 1730 to PMMA and 4092 for polystyrene. And we can do single frequency imaging and then only where those uh, respective particles appear is where it lights up. So the presence of non-absorbing species such as salts will generate no photothermal signal. Though they may scatter, they don't generate a photothermal signal. That's what we pick up on. Okay, uh, here's an example of um, some gold coated filters that have been used to filter out. Uh, this, was a, a poly, this was a microplastics application. Uh, in which there was also contained some some gelatin, which I think also acts as a nice model here for subvisibles analysis. If there's anyone here from the from the uh, biopharma industry, uh, that would work great. You can see the infrared spectra uh, detailed, high signal to noise, um, and you know when you're working with proteins, the infrared channel is always going to be far more information rich than the Raman. Uh, here's a uh, a polymer bead, a polymer particle. Um, on the in the infrared and the Raman, where these are all simultaneous measurements. Right? There's, probably, there's, there's about a few seconds worth of data collection here, and that gives you two data streams, infrared and Raman. Um, and if we put that through a library, um, turns out this is polycarbonate, that's it's a pretty convincing match both in the infrared and the Raman. That comes back to something I said earlier about the confirmatory aspects of this simultaneous approach. So you can see that when you have a good search in the infrared and a good search in the Raman, you can be damn sure and damn confident that it's actually the right hit. Whereas if you had a good search, good hit in the Raman and a dubious match in the Raman or vice versa, well, that's you know, it's a red flag. Um, live cell measurements, again, our main topic, and Peter will talk a lot about that later on, but one of my early measurements, like this is one of my first measurements, perhaps when I first started, was is a cheek cell. This is a really simple experiment where I put scraps of my own cheek cells onto a calcium fluoride slide, drop of water, put another cover slip on top, uh, and then just randomly, in fact, I, 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 in this case, I forgot to take a visible picture. But I started off with the visible, randomly flicking around, looking for some points of interest. And very quickly, I could see that the spectra were different depending on where in the cell was measuring. I could, I could see some lipids in some areas, uh, nucleic acids, and of course, proteins kind of everywhere. I'll point out here though, this is in water. Uh, so, and I have not done any 
water, water correction or water background corrections. So what we're seeing here is the water and all of the biochemistry. Okay. So noting that there are these interesting you know, peaks of interest, I then did single frequency imaging at only those wave numbers. And that's the RGB composite image that we obtain. And I thought, wow, that was a pretty impressive image for one of my first measurements. And it looks, looks like a fluorescence image. So not surprisingly, the nucleic acid is kind of all there, tightly packed into the nucleus. And we've got lots of uh, lipid inclusions scattered throughout the cell. And, and, and this image was collected at 500 nanometer resolution as well, so the 500 nanometer step size. Uh, nowadays, we do most of our imaging at around 100 nanometers. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, here's an example uh, from uh, Professor Nick Stone at Exeter. They were interested in microclassifications in tissues, and they came to us uh, having done some FTR imaging on this, um, and, they, they came, and they knew that there were some microclassifications micro here, as shown in the FTR images. Um, but when I was doing some single-point spectroscopy cross here, my first few spectra didn't actually show much calcification. So I thought, all right, let's, let's change tack here. And why don't we just do a single frequency image at the calcification peak, which is about 10 to 50 wave numbers. And when we did that, this is what we got. And that was a real surprise because from the FTIR image, the same area looked fairly uniform uh, when it came to the distribution of, of micro classifications. But quite clearly at 10 to 50, uh, it wasn't uniform. In fact, it was very heterogeneous. So here, here are some uh, point spectra uh, on and off these hotspots. You can see when you're on the hotspot, like this red one, you have massive calcification peak relative to the other typical biochemistry components. Uh, and, and in between, you have more regular uh, sort of protein-looking tissue spectra, which is you know what I saw to begin with. Uh, and this is really no surprise because, well, it's no surprise that the FTIR looked pretty uniform because at 1050 wave numbers, Remember, that's about almost 10 microns. It's about nine, nine and a half microns of light, and thus your spatial resolution is going to be in that order. Uh, and so if your spatial resolution is about nine or 10 microns, well, you're going to be struggling to see anything less than that. And, and the average size of these inclusions uh, was about five microns. And some of them are, in fact, less than a micron. So if, you're, if your particles of interest are five microns or less, you've got no chance of seeing them when you're probing them with 9 to 10 microns of light, which is what was happening with FTIR. Okay. Um, another, well, this is perhaps out of the biggest paper uh, that we've had, we've had so far, and that was uh, with Oksana Clementieva from Lund University, published in Advanced Science. Uh, she used OPTIR to look for evidence of, of, uh, of amyloid polymorphism, and she found evidence of that as well, which is why it's been so well received. But, you know, perhaps most exciting um, as, as an instrument guy for me that I like in this was actually this image. So on and off this, this sort of uh, semicircular feature, uh, this, these two points are separated only by 282 nanometers, yet we see differences in spectra. We see uh, differences associated with uh, beta structure uh, in, 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 in the protein. Right? And so I thought that was a pretty impressive uh, result for a far field optical mode instruments. Um, this is a more recent result. So this is uh, in um, in review, in fact, at the moment. It's been um, submitted. Uh, so here we looked at cell differentiation between a, a normal cell line or non-malignant cell line and two uh, different cancer cell lines. But the exciting thing here is, in fact, it's two exciting things. It's, it was really my first use of the CH uh, fingerprint QCL, but also this was done on regular thick glass slides. So these aren't cover slips, but these are regular old-fashioned glass slides. Uh, and the spectra you see on the screen are single coads, right? So these are about one second per scan. There's no post-processing. No post this is as raw and exactly what you see on the screen. This is a screen capture from the software. So this is coming from about half a micron spot. And these were cells fixed on regular glass slides. So you do see a bit of a glass hump over here because these are fairly thin. Uh, sections of thin cells, rather, once they are fixed. Uh, but the rest of it is completely free and, and uh, unhindered by the glass, which is which is something you can't do with regular FTIR. Right, so yes, an example of unblocked or, or unhindered glass measurements, submicron features easily detected. Um, and we were getting, and then like, taking those cells, I did single frequency imaging. This is, this is an optical image. Uh, taking 
a CH2 and CH3 ratio image gives me uh, an idea of chain length. So uh, the blue are the shorter chains and, and the larger the, the, the color or the warmer the color here indicates increasing chain length. Uh, taking CH2 to protein uh, peak ratio gives us an idea of lipid to protein um, in, in, in our sample. And it looks like we may see some uh, maybe nuclear membranes and then cellular membranes uh, being seen as well. That actually worked out really well. Uh, this is a paper from Kathy Goff. University of Canada, no, sorry, from Canada, University of Manitoba. Uh, and she compared FTR imaging to OPTI, uh, to OPTR and, and SNOM. Um, and she could see that she could um, do the uh, polarized measurement. So she, she's very interested in collagen stretching or, or stressed collagen, uh, looking at um, orientation under parallel and uh, perpendicular infrared light. Um, so FTI, I could do the polarization well, but I couldn't do the individual collagen fibrils, anything, certainly nothing less than 500 nanometers, in fact, nothing less than uh, several microns. Uh, SNOM uh, could see the fibrils, but it couldn't do both rotations. It could only do one of them. So it can't do both 90 degrees and zero. Uh, and OPTR was the only tool that could do both polarizations and also measure fibrils and tissues, and it could also do it on glass. So here's um, some examples of that. So it's the FTIR measurements um, on, so, so one is the parallel and one is perpendicular, blue is one and, and red is the other. Uh, so we've got far field OPTIR, so that's, that's matching the FTIR well. Then we've got far field OPTIR on the fibrils, is something that the FTI cannot do. And then the nano FTIR uh, can't do the, the, can do the fibrils, but can't do both polarizations. Right, so here's an OPTI, here's some more OPTI data along the fibril. Right, so that's again about half a micron in length there. So these are individual spectra along the length, uh, parallel and perpendicular. Um, and this is some tissue. So these aren't fibrils anymore, these are tissues. These are cut to about seven microns, if I recall correctly. Um, and what's interesting here is that um, whether you're measuring on calcium fluoride or on glass, the spectra look the same, right? So these are thin sec, these are thick sec, relatively thick sections. So when you're when you're more than a few microns in thickness above, you don't see a glass hump. Uh, so this is pretty exciting because uh, these these calcium fluoride and the like are relatively expensive and brittle substrates, and they've been used traditionally, uh, exclusively used with FTIR. Uh, this shows that with OPTIR, glass substrates are now a viable alternative. Okay. Um, a more recent paper from Liverpool um, with, uh, with, with the Goodacre group there. Uh, they, they used, uh, for the first time, used uh, OPTIR to look at individual bacteria uh, that were labelled uh, with uh, carbon-13 and carbon and, and, and nitrogen-15 uh, to look at. And that, from that, they can deduce various metabolic pathways. Uh, but you know, and then this has been done before. It's been done though on on mass, uh, on on thick or large areas of bacteria. But here they've targeted individual E. coli bacterial cells, and these are about one to two microns in size. You can see the, the spectra from the individual cells, depending on what they've been fed, obviously vary greatly with uh, with what they've been fed. Okay. Uh, this is some stuff that I've done myself with uh, with one of their samples, and this was a sample that was actually labelled with deuterium. This is uh, an example here of the other sort of special laser, the one that has the silent region chip. So you can see um, protein images at 200 nanometer steps. We've got a CD image, so a carbon deuterium bond, um, and you know, it's all obviously in this case all of the cells are labelled with uh, deuterium. Uh, but check this out. This is an individual E. coli cell. This is about two microns long and about a micron wide. And I've got individual spectra along the length. So we're doing intracellular bacterial imaging and spectroscopy with OPTIR. And this is the spectra that we get out of this. Right? And these spectra, the, the, these spectra are about the result of about 15 seconds each. Uh, and you're getting incredibly high signal to noise from, from you know, the smallest of particles, the smallest of samples. Uh, almost the same sample here, but this was done now with um, with the CH chip uh, QCL and simultaneously with Raman this time. So here now we're doing 
Raman single cell bacteria done simultaneously with OPTIR, which now also has the CH chip as well. Okay. Uh, okay, that's coming, bring, that brings me towards the end of my presentation. Key takeaways for me is that with OPTR, we're, we're taking it for its spectroscopy well beyond uh, the accepted and traditional limits. Um, and now, and then and bringing together the best of Raman uh, and IR into a single platform. Uh, with submicron, you see more detail. It's non contact, but it's no cross contamination. None of these dispersive scatter artifacts, me scatter, and the, and the like. So it's completely insensitive to sample shape and size. Little to no sample prep, uh, and some of these new QSOL options, uh, I think, have also opened up lots of new and exciting experiments. And something I haven't touched on at all, really, but I do want to sort of throw it out there a little bit for you to think about is we're now um, offering the option to add a fluorescence module to the microscopes um, for, you to, for you to do wide field epifluorescence um, that delivers well, that, that would mean co located fluorescence with OPTR, and that's um, pretty exciting as well, I think. Uh, so I'll finish off again with uh, IR plus Raman, same spot, same time, same resolution. Um, and with that, uh, I'm going to hand over to Peter. Uh, Peter, please take it away. So uh, thank you, Mustafa, for giving me the uh, opportunity to speak today and discuss our work on OPTIR and uh, concomitant Raman spectroscopy for uh, single cell analysis. I'm giving the presentation today, but uh, the work has been part of a uh, collaboration with Alice Spadier and Jane Lawrence from, from Pharmacy at the University of Manchester, Joanna Demby from Seda Pharmaceuticals, and of course, uh, your good cell. Uh, why do we want to use infrared spectroscopy to, to study single cells? Well, we've been doing this work for, for um, many years now, trying to get IR spectra, uh, um, because it, it's an extremely useful tool for uh, many uh, uh, areas of research. We've done a lot of work in infrared cytology, uh, in particular looking at the identification of cancer cells based on the biochemistry rather than visual inspection. We've done an awful lot of work on uh, drug cell interactions, and we're able to uh, uh, look at biochemistry changes at the single cell level and determine the response of a cell population. Um, and we've done a lot of work in stem cell uh, differentiation. Um, it's a good method of identifying differentiating uh, stem cells. Uh, but what we haven't been able to do is to really go further and look at uh, the subcellular uh, resolution uh, changes that we might expect to see either due to uh, disease progression or due to the interaction of the drugs or, or the uh, stem cell differentiation. So we'd like to take it to that next step. So just to um, uh, or give you an orientation of the spectrum of a biological cell, this is a, a typical infrared spectrum of a biological cell and you can see that uh, we can get information concerning the lipids, we can get information concerning the proteins, particularly from the amide 1 and the amide 2 bands, uh, some information on phosphate and, and, and carbohydrate. And when we look at a whole cell, of course, we just get a fingerprint. Um, that pattern is unique for that particular cell. But as I said, we can't get the subcellular information. The advantages of infrared is that the spectrum is a superposition of all the constituents, so we're measuring everything at the same time. Uh, the chemical nature of the uh, cell uh, molecules and their conformations can be obtained. Um, we can identify changes between particularly normal and cancerous cells, which is a main area of interest to us, and it's an opportunity for all the metabolic modifications induced by treatment. Um, it's label free and contact free. But as I said, the disadvantage are the spatial resolution is typically between 2.5 and 12.5 microns, depending on the wavelength. Uh, we often have to use sample fixation. Um, we have spectral artifacts. And if we're trying to do live cells, we've got strong water band absorption. So uh, we need to a, a technique that will give us our infrared spectrum without these disadvantages. Our spatial resolution. Um, is going to be determined by our wavelength. And of course, the wavelength for infrared, uh, infrared um, microscopy is, is quite large. And so 
uh, irrespective of the aperture that you're using, basically you've still got this problem of the wavelength dependent uh, uh, resolution, uh, which means for subcellular work, it's extremely difficult um, unless you're working only at the very uh, short wavelengths, which of course we're not. The interesting information, a my one band is marked on here, our resolution deteriorates. So of course, um, what we can use is the um, OPTIR system uh, because our spatial resolution is determined by the visible light. So the important thing here is that uh, with our Mirage system, uh, we've got good spatial resolution independent of infrared wavelength. Our system um, is the uh, basic setup. We've got the, uh, the QCL laser, uh, that impinges on our sample. We've got the green measurement uh, laser, the visible laser, um, which goes uh, to a, a detector and we can work either in transmission or reflection mode. And um, what we can do is we can actually collect the Raman spectrum from uh, derived from the green laser to give us both a Raman spectrum and an infrared spectrum of the same sample at exactly the same location and at the same time. We're very lucky that we've actually uh, can take this mirror out and we can actually use an OPO laser. And the beauty of this is we now also get the CH stretching region. So in this case, we've got the infrared covering the two main regions of the spectrum. As you can see, there's nothing biologically relevant in between here. So we've got the full infrared spectrum uh, and the full Raman spectrum across the whole wavelength range. And so we can actually get a good vibrational analysis of the sample under investigation. So uh, the aim of our study was to uh, use the OPTIR technology to study subcellular structure in fixed human cancer cells. Uh, we want to use the concomitant Raman spectra to be recorded simultaneously from exactly the same location. Uh, for using both the QCL and the OPO, OPO laser excitation. We wanted to um, uh, develop a sample preparation acquisition protocol to study live human cancer cells under aqueous conditions. So regarding that last point, the way that we uh, uh, do this, and, and we had a lot of input from, from Mustafa on this, so uh, we can grow our cells on a calcium fluoride plate, and here they are attached to the plate. Um, and they will attach to the plate and, and, and spread out just as in a normal cell culture experiment. Uh, we then wash and then we use a hydrophobic uh, pap pen and draw a border around the cells. We then have a clean calcium fluoride window that we place on top. And then we turn it upside down and we do our analysis. To start off with though, we need to um, just identify the key areas in the cell. And for this, we used fixed cells. So um, here is um, an optical image of a fixed cell. You can see roughly the, uh, uh, the outline of the cell here. This is the, uh, spe the infrared spectrum using the OPO laser. And this is the infrared spectrum using the QCL laser. So just to orient you, this, this is not exactly the same cell, but it's, um, it, it's exactly the same cell line where we've done some um, fluorescent staining. Um, and you can see that basically this area here is our uh, nucleus and this is a nucleolus. And this area here is, is mainly the uh, endopla endoplasmic reticulum, okay? And uh, what you can see is we've got uh, differences in the um, intensities of the A um, We've got noticeable variations depending upon location. Um, and we've got the olive green spectrum here. Um, looks like it might be a, a lipid droplet, and I'll come on to that later, but basically we have CH stretching vibrations here, but almost no protein uh, intensity. Um, in the CH stretching region itself, again, you can see that we've got 
quite noticeable variations in the structure here, um, depending upon uh, the location within the cell. Um, we've got the amide one and the amide two vibrations, and again, very large variation depending upon where you are uh, in in the cell. Um, uh, and there'll be elements of variation that's due to the uh, thickness at specific uh, locations. So uh, if we now uh, home in on uh, the CH stretching region, we've normalized the spectra um, across the region. So uh, these uh, variations in intensity are uh, have taken out the uh, element of thickness. But what I really want to focus on is the change in the CH2 to CH3 ratio uh, in, the, in the spectra. So if we look at these bottom three bands here, uh, particularly here, the green one, um, these all come from uh, the nucleolus or the edge of the nucleolus. And what you can see is that the, uh, the CH2 band is completely uh, suppressed in comparison to the CH3 band. Um, it's more dramatic here. Uh, this is completely consistent with the lack of lipids in, in the nucleolus. Whereas if you go out into the endoplasmic reticulum um, or possibly a lipid droplet, we're not quite sure, you can see that we've got um, a significant uh, amount of lipids. And, but in particular, it's the ratio that's important. We've got a complete switch in this ratio from the the bright green spectrum here to the olive green spectrum here. Is this reflected in the Raman? Um, as I say, uh, we're looking specifically at the ratios and what you can see, the colors actually match. It's a little bit of a crowded uh, slide, but in the green, uh, purple and, and black spectrum, what you can just about make out is that this shoulder completely disappears in the nucleolus indicating the lack of CH2 groups. So we generally get more variation in intensity in the OPTIR compared with the Raman. Um, but as I said, we've got uh, clearly indicating um, we've got lack of long chain lipids in, in, in the nuclear region. We can do line scans across this region. Um, and in this case, we're just looking at the area um, around the endoplasmic reticulum. And these are one micron uh, step size. So each spectrum is separated by just a micron. And you can see that there's significant variation. Uh, this is the intensity map at uh, 2935 wave numbers, which is the main uh, CH2, asymmetric CH2 vibration. Um, and again, uh, there's some interesting variations that are just one micron apart. And I think that, that that's the amazing thing about this system is that we're looking at infrared spectra that are just separated by a micron and they can be completely different. So if we look at the, the blue and the red spectrum, you can see that they are in areas of, of high lipid content, but there's also um, uh, reasonably high protein content. Um, if we look at the bright green spectrum here, which was right on the edge, uh, you can see uh, it has some protein content indicated by the amide A band here, but almost no lipid content. And if we just go one micron across in, si in step size here, uh, we have virtually no protein content, but significant lipid uh, content. So what you can see is we've got a high degree of structure uh, on the, the micron scale as we go across uh, what we believe is the endoplasmic reticulum. You can see by these sort of swirls that that's reasonably consistent with that. So uh, these are just some images that uh, show uh, um, that we've done the staining to uh, confirm that uh, this is we're looking in the right location. So if we look at the structure of this is an electron micrograph, this is uh, not our, our work, but what I want to uh, show you is that the, um, the structure here, now these are uh, only a few hundred nanometers apart, but then you can get to an area where um, this would have both lipid and uh, protein, 
but as you go into this uh, looming area here, this larger looming area, then you would have almost exclusively protein and no lipid. Whereas if you were in this densely packed area, which is basically a lipid membrane, you'd have very high lipid and no protein. So um, our, our line scan almost certainly has, has come across here and has gone into one of these um, areas where uh, you, you've got a complete change as you go across the structure. So looking now at the, um, the AMIG-1 band, um, again, we can see if we take our black, purple, and green spectra, although the intensities look very different, what you can see um, is that uh, they are always much broader than the other spectra that are outside the nucleolus. So there's considerable variation in, in intensity. The carbonyl band at 1742, uh, uh, which is present where you would expect lipids, etc., completely disappears when you go into the nucleolus. The spectra in the nucleolus are different um, uh, intensities, but have very similar shape. Um, and there's a general shift of the amide one band to higher uh, frequency, um, consistent with an increase in uh, DNA in the nucleolus. If we normalize the spectra, we can see this a little bit more clearly. So um, we, we, we've taken out most of the variation in, in intensity. You can see this, uh, this shift in um, uh, frequency here, the broadening of the band. And if we look at the second derivative, the interesting thing here is that um, even with, within the, 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 the cell, um, we can pick out all of the bands that you would expect to see in um, an amide uh, one uh, envelope. We've got the carbonyls, we've got the bands at 1700, 1619, 1680. Um, this is the main alpha helix band and the, these are the beta sheet bands. So what we can do is we can get very good uh, identification of the uh, broad class of uh, proteins and structures that are making up this amide one band. We haven't spoken much about the Raman, but the beauty of the con concomitant, concomitant Raman is that we can get complementary information. Um, again, I've kept the same locations here, but these are the Raman intensities. And what you can see here is the, the complementary nature of the IR and the Raman. You can see that the amide two band is almost completely missing in, in, in the Raman, but we've got a rich structure um, uh, further down in, in the fingerprint region. And again, we can see some really nice changes in this uh, region here, essentially the amide three band over quite short uh, distances. So the cluster of bands between 13, 40 and 12, 40 represents the amide three and the vibrations um, uh, essentially NH and CH deformations. The uh, 1237 band is mainly the asymmetric um, PO2 minus stretch, uh, which is from DNA and RNA. And uh, what you can see is that these increase significantly. Again, I'm looking at these three bands, the green, purple, and black. And the green, purple, and black have got uh, very high DNA content. Um, but as you move outside of the nucleolus, uh, this, uh, this disappears. Similarly, and this is uh, one advantage of having the, uh, the Raman um, with the infrared is that we can access these lower frequency bands. Um, and again, we've got a triplet of bands here at uh, 774, 740, and 714. They're all found in both DNA and in proteins, um, but you can see that the intensities are very different. And if I blow this up, you can see in DNA, this is the uh, 774 band. You can see we've just about got a triplet of bands, although there are two main features. But when we look at the proteins, this band almost disappears and these uh, this band comes up here. So the Raman is um, uh, really uh, helps um, identify 
uh, features along with the, uh, the infrared. The combination of the two techniques is actually really important. Let me talk about uh, live cells. We have done in, in the past a lot of live cell imaging. We've, we've done work at, uh, at, at the synchrotrons. We've done work using QCL uh, lasers. And uh, of course, there are some key problems. It's difficult. If you're doing live cells, you know, by definition, you have to keep your cells alive. And that means they have to be in an aqueous environment. They have to be in some kind of buffer solution can't be pure water, otherwise the uh, uh, osmotic uh, stress will, will destroy your cells uh, very quickly. Um, and as we all know, uh, water is an extremely strong infrared absorber. Um, uh, not only that, one of its key vibrations is in a very similar uh, region of the spectrum to the main AMI1 band, which is uh, important if you're looking at protein structure. But water is such a strong absorber, it won't penetrate more than about 10 microns of water. And so we're, we're really struggling um, to, uh, to cope with this situation. We've done some work at, uh, uh, in, in the UK um, where we've tried to squash the cells down in a microfluidic uh, cell. Um, and this is a sort of typical spectrum that you, you might see. The black spectrum is the water spectrum. You can see it completely saturate. Um, apologies that the scale is different, the different way round to I normally uh, to it I normally present. But but this is the the OH band of the water, the OH stretching. This is the bending mode, and uh, these are um, some cells. You can just about see that the the amide one band is completely obscured by the bending mode of the water. You can just see the amide two band as a shoulder here, and then you can see some structure of the cell here. So the blue spectrum is water plus the cell. The uh, black spectrum is, is just the water. So it's extremely challenging to get information from a spectrum like this. We do have water correction methods, etc., but it's difficult. So one way in which we can uh, uh, get around this is uh, using the OPTIR system. I mentioned at the beginning it was a question of developing um, a, a sample uh, preparation and, and measurement protocol. If we culture our cells onto a plate but then turn it upside down, uh, we can put in our um, IR bit and it interacts with the cell without having to go through much water at all because it's directly cultured onto the surface. Now there will be some water within the cell, um, but it hasn't got to go through a water layer. We can then put in our probe beam, and although this does go through the water, that's not a problem because the water is essentially transparent to the visible light. And this means that we can get infrared spectra of the cells in the aqueous in, in environment with very little interference from the water itself. So let me show you some spectra. Near PACA cells, um, these are the pancreatic cell, cancer cells that we've been using. And uh, this is uh, an image um, and using the QCL spectra, the, the QCL laser. So this is in, in, in the fingerprint region. And uh, although it, it might be a little difficult to see, what you can see is the, the red trace here is of the buffer solution. That's in an area where there's a gap between the cells. There's no cells here. And you can see this is the, there is a water spectrum there. But when we move on to the cell, so for example, here, the, the um, blue spectrum, um, you can see we've got, an amide one, an amide two, and the uh, the cellular vibrations very clearly observed, um, and this shows that we're not getting very much interference from water at all. In fact, the amide one to amide two ratio is very similar to that that you would get actually in your fixed cell spectra. Um, so this means that we can analyze our cancer cells in the aqueous uh, environment. And we're getting um, structural uh, information. You can see if we go down here, the blue spectrum again. We think this is a nucleolus. We've got a very high 1088 band. 
um, which is the a, a, a phosphate band, um, and then when we move off into the the cytoplasm, this this band uh, disappears. We can see this actually on a different cell line. This is a breast cancer cell line, so we've done uh, several uh, different types of uh, a cell line, um, and again. The red you can see is the uh, the buffer. The green um, is a spectrum in the cytoplasm, and the uh, the blue we think is on a, a nucleolus, and we can see the high 1088 band. So uh, 1088 band is indicative of the uh, the nucleolus, and the uh, the green spectrum we think is the cytoplasm, uh, and it works for two different cell lines. So. Uh, both cell lines show uh, a nice strong 1740 band when we believe that we're on, on lipids. The AMIP1 band is the, the main band that we're interested in if we're looking at protein structure. Um, but as I said before, that is where the water band causes interference. Um, however, you can see from this spectrum here, this is a, 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 another group of Myopaca cells. Um, you can see that we've got a very strong uh, lipid band, which we can easily identify. It's in the, the blue and the, the, the pink spectrum. In this case, uh, we're in a lipid-rich region, and uh, we can see that this uh, completely uh, disappears when we think we're on uh, a nucleus. Um, what about the structure in the band? Well, it's, it's, it's consistently there. And uh, we showed before that on the fixed cells, we could um, determine some protein structure. Um, in these live cells, it's uh, not quite as, as prominent as uh, in the fixed cells, but nevertheless, we can very clearly see uh, changes in the carbonyl region here. And uh, we've got pretty much the same structure that we saw uh, in the fixed cells, we can pull out of the live cell structure, particularly the 1657, consistent with the alpha helix, um, the uh, bands due to the uh, beta sheet. So even in a water um, uh, or an aqueous system, we're able to pull out features of the AMI-1 band despite the interference of water, which I think is pretty incredible. So if we now look at the uh, spectra obtained with the OPO, uh, you can see um, we've got these tiny lipid, uh, what we think are lipid droplets. Um, and you can see from the scale bar here, we're picking out features that are uh, a micron or less. And in fact, we have some examples where we go down to uh, half a micron um, as, uh, as expected. Um, it's interesting that the bright spots in with the OPO laser are in, in a completely different place compared with the QCL laser, which is uh, as expected. We're picking up different um, uh, different things, and it shows you the advantage of being able to access the higher wave number uh, regions of the uh, the spectrums. Um, uh, it's important. So the green spectrum here. Um, I don't know if you can see the, the uh, green position here, it co coincides with a bright spot in the QCL image, but there's um, very little lipid here. Um, so uh, again, that indicates that um, that's near uh, the nucleus. Um, the blue and the uh, pink are areas of high lipid content um, these are associated with these uh, bright spots here. As I say, the smallest features that we can identify are approximately half a micron, which is consistent uh, with the um, spatial resolution determined by the uh, 532 nanometer green beam. Uh, does it make biological sense? Again, we've done our staining. Uh, here is the nucleus. And in this case, we've stained for liposomes. This is um, 10 microns uh, scale bar. Um, and you can see that the bright uh, spots due to the uh, lipid uh, liposomes are almost identical in size to the spots that we have using the OPO uh, laser. So um, we can pick out these uh, relatively small 
uh, small features. So on that note, I want to uh, conclude what uh, I've shown is that the, the first use of the OPO and QCL and concomitant Raman for spectroscopic analysis of fixed and live biological cells. We can obtain high spatial resolution, um, half a micron or so uh, of infrared spectra of biological cells. Um, we can get um, the infrared and the Raman uh, at the same time from the same spot with the same spatial resolution gives us complementary information that helps us understand uh, the uh, structure within the cells that we're looking at. Um, the spectra collected are relatively pure along the spectrum. We have no spatial blur uh, from the surrounds. We can even get relatively undistorted AMI1 bands in live cells in an aqueous environment, which is, I think is pretty amazing. Uh, so we can do enhanced studies, drug cell interactions and, and cell response to stimuli at the subcellular level, which is something that we've been wanting to do for, for, for a long time. So uh, here's uh, the team that, that did most of the work. And uh, I'll uh, say um, thank you for, for listening and I'm happy to take any questions. Great. Well, thank you, uh, Peter, for the um, informative talk, as always. Uh, I am conscious of time, so we do have a few questions coming in. Um, I think the first one I'll throw your way, Peter. Um, it says, uh, how long can you keep the cells alive? So with the system that uh, we uh, have introduced, um, we've been able to run overnight 12 hours or so um, we think we can push that to, to 24 hours. We've done uh, tripan blue staining just to make sure that our cells are still viable after that time, uh, and they are. Um, so, um, uh, so it's 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 quite robust. Um, obviously, it would be better if we had a, a sort of purpose designed um, uh, microfluidic type cell that we could keep these um, uh, cells alive. Um, uh, for much longer periods of time, but at the moment, for for the work that we've done now, uh, we are um, we're happy with uh, that we can do at least twelve hours. Okay, um, and the next one is also for you. I think a lot of these actually for you. Um, how thick is the water layer? So it's uh, that's a good question, and and I can't give a definite answer. Uh, there is some variability because of the. the uh the use of the the pat pen um because we draw we, we seal it with with the pat pen and that gives you um a uh, a water or a thickness of probably of the order of 10 to 15 microns but we're not completely sure um the beauty of it is though it, 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 it whereas when we've done this at the synchrotron you would see big variations depending upon that thickness. Um, here we see hardly any variation depending on that thickness because uh, as explained, um, the infrared beam hits the cell first and it doesn't matter if nothing gets through um, because it's the visible beam that gets through the water. So even though there's variability in that thickness due to just you know the variability in how you draw your your, your uh, marker with the pat pen. It doesn't matter that the, the spectra look roughly the same. Okay, um, I think the next one's a good one as well. Actually, um, what spectral processing, uh, such as mean scatter corrections, uh, were done on the spectra you showed? Uh, so there was uh, no um, mean scatter uh, correction. Um, so we, we um, haven't needed to do the me scatter correction. They're, they're all of the spectra are relatively artifact uh, uh, free. Um, it's because you're probing uh, with the visible beam. And I think um, uh, that means that you, you don't get the same artifacts. Um, we haven't seen at all in any of the spectra that we've seen any dispersion type artifact at all. Um, so we haven't run it through uh, through that. Well, obviously we we we, uh, we have done done pre-processing standard sort of um, 
uh, baseline uh, correction, normalization, uh, et cetera. And you saw that we did some second derivative uh, work. Um, uh, but actually, the spectra are relatively uh, artifact free and on reasonable baselines. So, in that regard, it's actually quite easy. You know, Peter, actually, I, I, may, I may stress a little bit there. I think it's one of the um, huge advantages of this technique uh, is that, you know, the, 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 the bane of many a biospectroscopist with me scattering that happens, especially when you're looking at cells in a fixed state or looking at tissues uh, with uh, edges or with air gaps uh, and the spectra go absolutely haywire there. Uh, that's something you just don't see at all. Uh, so I've, I've, you know, I've, I've done a lot of bio um, studies with this technique, with on cells and on tissues. Um, and the precision and, and the reproducibility, uh, regardless of where you are in the cell, whether you're on the edge or the middle, uh, is, is pretty, pretty remarkable. So it's something really encouraging to move this technique forward uh, in this sort of application. Uh, and I think uh, I'll do maybe one more question. Um, and uh, maybe we'll do the depth of sampling. I'll, I'll take that one. Uh, the depth of sampling is going to be very much um, sample sample dependent, but I think in this case, in, in, in hydrated cells, it's going to be a couple of microns. Uh, you know, most of the infrared light will be uh, absorbed um, in those uh, first couple or a few microns, uh, and then the the probe beam is is free to pick up those perturbations and then and, and pass that on. To the uh, to the visible detector, so uh, you're, you're probing most of that the uh, z depth of of the cell. Uh, look, there's a few more questions there, but uh, I am conscious of time, so I will uh, wrap this up. So um, I'll thank you again, Peter, for taking the time out of your um, busy schedule, and and certainly all of the audience members for uh, tuning in. There's been a lot of interest in this presentation, just based off the fact also of your of your um, publication. So. Uh, once again, thank you all. The, um, I'll remind you all that this is a recorded webinar, um, so a link will be available. Or you can also visit our website to see uh, the recorded version of this. So feel free to pass it on to any friends or colleagues who you think might be interested. Um, and with that, I'm going to bid you all um, a good day and thank you again. Bye bye.